Thank you, Megan, and as our children head to Children's Church, we turn our script... <laughs> We turn our attention today to the scriptures. We'll be starting this Sunday a new message series, a new sermon series we're calling Next. As we think about the future and what does the future hold, what is next? And over these weeks we will be hearing from and listening to the Old Testament prophets. The prophets who spoke words of warning, words of clarity, words of hope about the future. And so as we begin today, we'll be reading from the book of the prophet Joel. We'll be reading in the second chapter, kind of the second half of the second chapter. And just a bit of context as we hear this um, reading today, the first half of chapter 2 Joel is giving a message to the people that they need to hear, that they need to get things right with God. And indeed, that there is judgment, there is hard times coming because they have not listened to God. Probably one of those moments, you know, like when your mother told you, well, if you keep walking down that path, I can tell you what's going to happen. Same sort of message from Joel and so many of the prophets. If you keep walking down this road, I can tell you what's going to be happening, and it isn't necessarily pretty. But in the second half of chapter 2, the speaker shifts. It is no longer Joel giving God's message of warning and the hope of repentance, but then it is God speaking, the Lord speaking speaking a message when they turn back to him of hope and life abundant. So with that context, this second half of Joel chapter 2, will you hear the word of the Lord? Joel chapter 2, beginning at verse 23. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the late rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never, be, never again be put to shame." You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days I will pour out my Spirit." I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth and blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your forgiveness and for your message of new life and new possibilities. Your message for the future. Open up our hearts, our minds, our very selves to you today, Lord God that we might take our cues, our hope about what's next from no other source but you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Joel chapter 2 that we read from and that I mentioned earlier is a unique passage of Scripture. Joel is only three chapters long, so chapter 2 is right in the middle. But the very first half of chapter 2, the part we didn't read that was alluded to, where 
Joel is prophesying about coming judgment, prophesying about a swarm of locusts that will be destructive, about a future that does not sound so hopeful. Well, Joel, with all the prophets of the Old Testament, when there is a word of warning, when there is a word about what can happen, that if you keep going down the road you're going down, here's where it leads. Joel, like all the other prophets, does that not because they see a future that is full of doom and gloom and without possibilities, but Joel, like all the other prophets, speaks words about God's desire, about this disconnect between where we are right now and where God intends for us to be. This disconnect between what is and what should be, between how our behavior is now and how it ought to be. This disconnect between what society should look like and what it does look like. Joel, along with all the other prophets, calls out this disconnect between what is and what could be and what should be in God's plan. But the calling out is not for judgment. Joel does not have this power. None of us have the power of judgment. But the message comes from God as an opportunity An opportunity to change our hearts, to change our ways. The church word for it is repentance. To turn and to go the other way. To live our lives in such a way that it matches more closely to what God intended for us. To reorder our life together that it might look more like God's plan and God's dream for our community. There is a chance in every prophet's words in every message for us to turn once again to God, to turn toward God. And that is exactly what happens in this passage. This message comes that the people should turn toward God, and when they turn toward God, God steps in. God makes the pivot point in chapter 2. You see, the first part of chapter 2 is one of the readings for Ash Wednesday. We've preached on it before on Ash Wednesday. That day that we remember that we came from dust and one day we'll return there. That day when we remember our own mortality and aren't afraid to remember our deaths. That day in which we remember that we have some sin and some repenting to do. Joel... Chapter 2, the first half, is set out for Ash Wednesday. But the second part, the second part which we just read, you'll recognize a part of what the prophet Joel says there as well, don't you? Because the use of the passage turns from Ash Wednesday and its call to repentance, it turns towards Pentecost. Towards Pentecost. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in fact, quotes the prophet Joel, and he says, this is what is happening in your midst. God is pouring out His Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. This is what is happening, Peter says, on the day of Pentecost, when God's Spirit is poured out on the church, when the church is born. Joel Chapter 2 goes from Ash Wednesday to Pentecost. It goes from ashes to fire. This fire of the Holy Spirit, this vibrancy and new life and new possibilities of fire. Joel chapter 2 goes from ashes to fire and the pivot point, the turning point is God. What comes between Ash Wednesday and Pentecost after all? But Jesus but Jesus, but Good Friday and the cross, but Easter Sunday morning and the resurrection, but God's own initiative in loving us, in saving us, in coming towards us, and offering us forgiveness and hope and new life if we will but turn towards God. 
And so for this second half of Joel chapter 2, we get the fire, we get the Pentecost, we get the promise about the future that God will be in our midst, that we will be provided for, that indeed God's Spirit will come and rest on us and give us a future full of hope and full of life. Over these next few weeks as we are considering what's next, what comes next? You know, if you've lived any time at all, we always have that question, what's next? Children even have lived long enough to be asking what's next, right? It's a common question. Well, what are we going to do next? And we as humans, as adults, as Youth as children, we are always asking the question as well to ourselves about what is next. What does the future hold? What does the future hold? And so we are turning to the prophets, because not because prophets have a magic crystal ball that they look into and see the future. That's not the prophet's of the scriptures, but because the prophets have this living, vital relationship with God, this hope that is grounded in God and no other, that allows us to see the promises of God and how they shape and form our future, how we can ask what is next, not expecting like a child an exact answer about what we're going to do for dinner and what activity will be after that, but we can ask the question, what's next, knowing that we trust in this God who has promised to be with us, who has promised to pour out the Holy Spirit, who has certain things that are promised. There is hope. When we consider the future, for some of us, and sometimes when we think about the future, we have this predisposition uh, to be a little pessimistic about the future, to buy into this story that our culture sometimes propagates, that sometimes people in the church have put forward, even though it is terribly unbiblical. This idea that in the future somehow things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, that things are just falling apart, things are going to hell in a handbasket, we might say. Have you ever met anybody who has that outlook about the general future? Oh, don't act like you haven't, right? Have you ever had that outlook on the future? Well, things are just getting worse. It's called a declension narrative. Everything is just getting worse. And we, if we are not careful, might have that attitude in our lives, in our society, in our church. But this attitude of the world being a declension, a narrative, and Jesus is going to have to step in at the end to put an end to it and love us all is not biblical at all. Indeed, the message that we get from the prophets, the message we get from Jesus, the message we get from the scriptures is indeed that God is intervening in our world, that the Spirit is poured out, that there is hope and life abundant, and that God is making all things new. There is hope, there is life, there is promise for the future. And when we think about our futures, whether it be individually, whether it be as a church, whether it be collectively as a society, we have to be careful when thinking about what is next, that our starting point is not the circumstances, that our starting point is not what we heard on the news or we read on the internet, that the starting point is not what we heard Somebody else say, but our starting point in thinking about the future is God. Is this God who has revealed Himself to us in Jesus Christ, this God of hope, this God who promises to pour out His Spirit, this God who is ultimately in control of the future and whatever comes next, this God that we can trust. What is next? I don't know. But I know that after ashes comes fire, that after death comes resurrection, that after shame comes wholeness, 
that after fragmentation comes God pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. What is next? The future is full of hope because it depends on God. And our part to play is to turn our trust, our thinking about the future, our planning, our hoping, our dreaming to be securely based on this God who will change everything, who will change the trajectory of things if we but turn toward God. A God who says that I will repay you for the lost years. A God who says that things will be full, that there will be enough for us. A God who says we shall, and not just us, but our neighbors as well, if we'll invite them, shall eat plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord. A God who says though we have been put to shame, the future is not defined by shame. A God who says that He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. On all flesh, right? So if we think about even just ourselves, what kind of future does God have for me? What is God calling me to do? How is God calling me to live in the world? How does it work for my family and my neighbors? Are we included in this message of hope and life and vitality? Well, we start by asking the question, do you have flesh? Right? Check. Yep. Does that include you? Y'all asleep this morning just because it's raining. Don't mean you got to be asleep. Do you have flesh? Yes. All right. Your son. Oh, God says He will pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Anybody a son or a daughter? Oh, that includes everybody too, right? See, the choir gets it. Okay. Does that include everybody? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, shall speak God's word, shall have God's hope. That's all of us, by goodness, isn't it? Your old men shall dream dreams. I'm not going to ask who's old and who's young. I'm going to let you decide that on your own. I see Sid threatening me back there, so I will keep that to myself. Even on my male and female slaves, even on people who are rich or poor, who follow fall anywhere on the spectrum from freedom to not freedom, or anywhere on the economic or educational basis, even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit, God says. And so we all have hope because God's spirit is there to be poured out and in all of us to proclaim hope and life and joy in this future that God has for us and God has for us together in the church too often church we start with the starting point in thinking about the future somewhere else other than God we start it with our problems with money or our problems with relationships or how things aren't like they used to be but if our starting point is God Almighty who promises and has come good on His promises to pour out His Spirit on male and female, young and old, sons and daughters, all flesh, then what is next? If God is with us, is that our ashes will turn to fire and the turning point will be Jesus. The turning point will be Jesus. What's next? We'll think about it together as a church, and we have a next, right? We celebrated earlier this year being um, at this location, physical location, for 100 years of laying the cornerstone. In a little over four years, we will celebrate being in this community in two, for 200 years. We've got plenty of history, plenty of experience with a faithful God, and we can always be asking, what is next? Because there is a future with hope, a future that we can rely on because God has promised to pour out His Spirit and let our sons and our daughters, the people who come after us, to prophesy and to speak God's word. 
God has promised that even our old men and women shall dream dreams. Hmm. And our young men and women shall see visions and on rich and poor, slave and free, God will pour out his spirit. And so when we consider what is next, if we want to hear from God, and we all say we want to hear from God, then we'll have to start listening because God has already poured out his spirit. We'll have to take the risk on listening to the people that other people aren't listening to. Hmm. Listening to each other. Listening for words of prophecy from both our sons and our daughters. Listening to the old and what their dreams are for the future and listening to the young to see what their vision is for the days to come. Listening to those who have and to those who have not. And knowing that in it we shall find and hear and listen to a God who is bringing hope and salvation and life to us all. What's next? What's next for us? What's next for the church? I don't know exactly because God doesn't work that way. But what I do know is that there is hope and life abundant and that all things will be made new and that God is pouring out his spirit on our smallest children and speaking through our oldest members that if we will but listen, we can hear the voice of God and move forward with hope because our hope is not based on current circumstances or societal trends or financial investments, but our hope is based on the Lord Jesus Christ who came in the midst of our need for forgiveness and repentance, who came at our Ash Wednesday moment and loved us and transformed us and made Pentecost with its fire that moves and drives us possible. What's next? I don't know any better than you do. But what's next is that God will be there. God will be in our midst. God's spirit will be among us. And we will indeed have a future if we choose to participate in it, if we choose to trust God. It's full of hope and life and vitality and growth and making the gospel known and caring for the poor and listening to our neighbors and changing their lives and seeing Jesus so abundantly and powerfully at work that the whole world is drawn to him when his name is lifted high. We will go from ashes to fire and the turning point is Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us when we think we are good calculators for what's going to happen next in the future. Forgive us for our doom and gloom. Free us, we pray, that our thinking, that our living, that our planning might be enlivened by fire from the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord God, today to trust your promises and to see our lives transformed. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're going to stand and sing our hymn of response in just a moment. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation for our future is laid in God's word, God's promises to pour out the Spirit. And if today, brothers and sisters, you've heard the message about Pentecost and you think, well, that sounds nice, but I don't know that God's Spirit is at work in me, today's the day. It's real simple. you just got to turn toward Jesus and just say, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on me. And God is faithful to answer that prayer. And today, I invite you to dream and imagine with our firm foundation in the Lord about our future together as a church, that God will do incredible things. Start dreaming.
I'm not going to make the distinction about if you're old, you need to dream. If you're young, you need to see visions. I'll let you sort out which age category you fall in yourself. But dream and vision and prophesy, and we want to hear about how God is at work in your life through the Holy Spirit. Let's stand and sing together.